Welcome to Great Players of the Past, February 11th, 2020. Uh, today's player is from several countries, like you guys, Sevely Tartakower, and he was born in Soviet Russia, in Rostov on Don. And what that means is, since I was there, before you were born, including you, uh, Rost Don is a river um, in, in, in Russia, and the Rostov is the city, and it's on the Don River. So it's Rostov on Don. You see what I'm saying? No? And one of my ex-wives, I don't remember which one, she played in an interzonal in your favorite city, Azov. Okay? Azov is a very small town. However, there's the Sea of Azov. And that's actually a big sea. Okay? You know, like the Black Sea, but it's not the Black Sea. No? All right. So, actually, Azov is like 30, 40 miles from Rostov. So you got to fly into Rostov and then take a bus and then ride a donkey and so forth. <laughs> anyway, that was a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Rostov has a lot of people, okay, way over a million, but you never heard of it. When the class is over, I could ask you, for example, what city was he born in? You'll be like, what? So mm. should I do that? That'd be funny, right? Especially if he says what. And then we'll find out if they speak English and what. Now, Tartakower moved around. Okay, he lived in Poland and France and basically any country in Europe, whether it still exists or not, nobody knows. Okay, and he didn't speak Polish, but he did represent Poland in several Olympiads. Okay, he was one of the top 10 players in the world for many years and he beat, you know, some world champions. He also wrote a lot of chess books and magazine articles and such, mainly and such. And he also represented France in the Olympiad. And then uh, he died when he was 68. And there's several opening variations named after him. There's this one, which I've never seen. That's named after him. It makes no sense. Then there's the normal one, which we're going to look at today. Now, if you're following the Cairns Cup, which you're not, and in fact, most of you haven't heard of it, that's a women's tournament that's going on in St. Louis right now. It's considered the strongest women's tournament ever, although it's not, but it's considered that, okay? And unfortunately, there's two Americans playing, so that lowers the average rating, the lowest rated players, okay? Um, but the other players are pretty good. Anyway, the reason I told you that story is in one of the games today, the Tartar Cowher variation was played, the one that I know, and that game is still going on right now, even though it started like six hours ago, okay? And the person with black is going to win that game, the one who played the Tartar Cower. So that's pretty good. Okay, now, there are sayings in chess, most of which I made up, you know, like never play F6. However, before I was born, Tartar Cower made up most of the sayings. Okay, there's many, many websites dedicated to his sayings, stuff that he said, like this site, Tartar Cower Quotations, and this one, Tartar Cower Quotes. Top 25 quotes by Tartakower. Okay? So that's pretty good. Right? The winner is the one who makes the next to last mistake. I've never beaten a healthy opponent and so forth. Never win a game by resigning, etc. Okay? I like to talk to myself because then I'm dealing with a better class of people. Okay? Yeah. All right. Anyway, so Tartakower had a lot of sayings that were attributed to him. And he also has... The Queen's Gambit Decline Tower Cower Variation. It's also named after two players you've never heard of, Maka Gondov and Bondarevsky. If I'm not mistaken, which is 50-50, I might be mistaken, I've, ar I've already done a lecture on Bondarevsky. I think I have. Okay, and that's this position in front of you. See this position? Okay, it's a Queen's Gambit and Black plays H6 and B6. That's the Tower Cower Variation. And... That was played today, and the game is still ongoing, um, by the best female player in India, Humpy Canero, and she's winning. She's going to win with the black pieces. I used to play that when I was a kid, then I stopped playing it. Okay, then there's chess games of Tartar Cower. There's a picture of him. That picture reminds me of Ryshevsky. Not sure why exactly. Okay, and the Wikipedia article is pretty long. Okay, on, on uh, you know, Tartakower, because he was good. 
Okay? These are some of his famous comments. These are some of the books that he's written. Okay? And notable games, mainly and so forth. So Tarakar was a pretty colorful character. Okay, now when I show great players of the past, occasionally, and by occasionally I mean usually, you guys are like, who's that guy? Okay, so there's two, four, six, seven of you. How many of you before today heard of Tartakower? Um. Yeah, and Karen's like, I'm on my phone, leave me alone. All right, and she heard of him, right? Easy. You heard of him? Yeah. Yeah, that's about half of you. Okay, and then when the lecture's over, maybe more than half of you have heard of him, maybe. You guys are like, who? Okay, so what I like to do to prove that they're worthy of a lecture is show games they beat famous people, people you've heard of, world champions. Now, some of you haven't heard of Schlechter. Schlechter very famously played a match with Emmanuel Lasker, and that match ended in a tie with Lasker winning the last game. If Lasker didn't win, then Schlechter would have won the match. Then you would have heard of Schlechter as the world champion. There's argument to this day. I don't know the answer because I wasn't alive in 1900s, in 1910. I, there's an argument as to whether Schlechter had to win by two points, which doesn't make any sense. Some people argue if Schlechter won five and a half, four and a half, he wouldn't be world champion. That's hard to believe. And he had a better position, but he had to win, so he lost. I don't know if any of that's true. Okay. But anyway, Schlechter was a solid player. There's a variation of the Slav defense named after him. And he was one of the top five or ten players in the world. Except he was playing Tartakower. Tartakower played very interesting chess, so he's fun to look at his games. Okay? And one of his famous sayings is, I like to sacrifice my opponent's pieces, which I use a lot. However, in the games I'm going to show you, he doesn't necessarily do that. Okay? Now, if this game was played a hundred years ago, at least... What move would White play that White wouldn't play today? In this position. You. F4. F4. The King's Gambit. Not very common today. Pretty common back then. Okay. And Schlechter declined. Bishop C5. Okay. That's a good move. And they played, you know, sort of normal. I don't think taking this is normal. I don't think that's a normal move. But I don't really know the theory. Played c3 to play d4, and then took a pawn, give a pawn, take a pawn. Now, the last two, three, four moves, white could have taken that pawn, but that would be a losing blunder. White could have taken this pawn on move three, on move four, on move five, but that's a terrible move. How come? You. Because of queen h4. Queen h4. After knight f6, queen h4 is not possible. So now the move's okay. Okay, castles. All right, so they have equal material. And this is the whole point of the king's gambit, if you're white, is black has no center pawns, and white's f pawn is missing, but he actually likes that because he wants to do stuff here with his rook. So he has a center pawn, and black has no center pawns. It's very similar to the queen's gambit. It's just the other side of the board. The queen's gambit... You're also trying to get rid of black center pawns, and black usually declines in that line also. Okay, h6, put it in h. Grandmasters today normally don't play so passively. They see four pieces here, and they try to get them out. But okay, h6, protecting g5. Always retreat. Two bishops, what else? I don't think a grandmaster would play c5 today. Grandmasters like their bishops. Okay, so white's very active, because I said so. And the rook is active. The bishop is active. These pieces, not so good. I don't like that. Okay, not, not good for black. Takes. Knight takes f7. I thought Schle uh, Tartakower sacrificed his opponent's pieces, but not this game. Now, Tartakower wrote... This game did not win the brilliancy prize because black's play was no good. Letting white sacrifice everything, creating weaknesses, not developing this. And then some guy on the internet said the game that did win the brilliancy prize this tournament 
which was also Tower of Cower. Um, they later found his opponent made like the worst move in chess history. This move was a lot, this game was a lot better. But you know, the judges are judges. Okay, take the knight. Notice the knight is pinned because I said so. See how the knight's pinned? So white played a move taking advantage of the knight being pinned. Let's call it a random student, archer. Queen h5 check. Knight takes queen is illegal, which wouldn't stop some of you. And after he went back, he played another brilliant tactical move. It's a tactical move. Remember, don't allow knight takes queen. That would be bad. Take the knight with the rook. Yeah. And this is the guy who said sacrifice your opponent's pieces. Now, Tauterkauer, this is well known. Some of you probably know. He was a big fan of my stream, okay? And he was like, oh, always sacrifice the exchange, fine gold, okay? And I'll prove he was a fan of my stream. We'll see later, okay? Now, obviously, frankly, if queen takes, the rook on e8 is no longer protected. Queen takes rook on e8, okay? Pawn takes looks a little risky. Queen g6 check, bishop takes h6, queen h7. That looks like you're getting mated. So Black played a Swishensug in 1909. That was one of the early examples of a Swishensug. What did Black do? We'll call it another random student, Archer. Rook e1. Rook e1 check. Now the rook's not hanging. White doesn't want his rook hanging, so rook f1. And then always play... King captures f1. Bishop f1. What? Always play Bishop F1. I told you that Tartakar liked my stream. Always play Bishop F1. Okay. Now, always play Bishop F8. See, I was ahead of my time. Now, White hasn't sacrificed anything for a move or two. So, time to sacrifice something, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, Black is setting up for the next game. It's not the best development I've ever seen. Close. Okay, Queen F6. Doesn't want to get mated. And now, again, white hasn't sacrificed anything for a couple of moves. Now, if you get a book on clearance sacrifices on the clearance rack at the bookstore, right? Okay, this would be on the cover. Okay, along with the famous game Steinitz von Bartleben from which tournament? The only tournament I've ever talked about a hundred years ago. The Hastings. Hastings, 1895. And what move did Steinus play that was the clearance sacrifice? Bishop D3, D5. D5, Archer knows. Okay. So this is also a clearance sacrifice, giving the answer away. Let's call on a random student, Archer. Uh, That's what Karen would play, Knight D6. Right, Karen? She's like, what? Okay. <laughs> And that clears what square? It's an explosive square. C4. C4. White wants to play bishop C4 with advantage. You guys like bishop C4? Yeah. Yeah. If you're white, you do. What? Yeah. You don't like that? Yeah. Okay. And the knight was on C4. He had to get rid of that knight. And the guy's like, all right. And then he did that. And black played the obvious move. King F1. King F1 x clam. <laughs> you mean king f8 right if king f8 queen h8 made is annoying so bishop e6 and then he played a paul morphy move queen e8 is a fine move but that's not what paul morphy would do rook f1 yeah rook f1 getting the last piece into the attack man charter car is pretty good all right now there's too many threats Rook takes queen, queen e8 check, so he gave his queen away. Always play. Bishop f1. Bishop f1, again. Right. Now, white's up material. Maybe he should keep sacrificing, though. Okay, bishop d3. Always retreat. Keeps retreating, that's good. g4, Matt Larson style. And then bishop h7, not really a sacrifice. All right, and then Black's like, all right, I give up. I'm so lost, I can't even believe it. So that was a crushing victory for Tartakower early in his career because Tartakower played the 1900s, 
1910s, 1920s, 1930s, and 1940s. Right? Pretty good, right? This was a 1909. Okay, pretty crushing victory. And then black resigned because white's not going to sacrifice anymore. White's just going to win easily. Black gave up. I like that game. That game was annotated by Lasker. So Lasker must have thought he was pretty good. Okay. The next game was against Geza Marazzi. And somehow it didn't get rid of the notations. I don't know. All right, I got to do all this Spencer stuff. You with a crazy comment. Is he the one that made the Marazzi by? Correct. That's right. Very good. Okay, I did all the crazy Spencer stuff. How do I flip the board? Probably flip board. Yeah, there we go. Okay, this is Marazzi versus Tartakower from 1922. Okay, and not only... What's that? What's the question? What was Tartakower, white or black? Black, yeah. And that's why I put black at the bottom. That, that was why I did that. Now... Tartakower could have played the Tartakower, but we're saving that for the end because Tartakower. Okay, this game, I was telling Spencer, this is a good game. This is about an hour ago. And Spencer said, that's his most famous game. I know that game. This one. Okay, remember, he said sacrifice your opponent's pieces. But what he said and what he did maybe was different. Okay, he played the Dutch. And he played the... A3, you know, what, 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 what is this? Was this 1922? Oh, wait a minute. Okay, he played the Stonewall. So what move did Black play? D5. Yeah, he sh I thought he played D5, and he played D5 later. He tricked me. Okay, so he's playing a Stonewall Dutch. That's the Stonewall. Okay, and White's playing sort of passively. Boo! Okay, <laughs> now in the Stonewall... There's a player you've never heard of who lives in Georgia who's rated 2,400 who always plays the stone wall. You. That's right. He has heard of him. The only question you've ever gotten right. Good job. Okay. Right. Then what happened? He's not your coach? But you, he taught you the stone wall, I bet. Lucky guess. We have a kids tournament. Every kid in here plays the stone wall because they're all getting lessons from the same guy. Okay. And Deepak Aaron plays the way this guy did. He checkmates them, and then he wins. Then you guys play it, and you're like, I don't understand. Okay. Now, the problem with this opening is these pieces. But it doesn't matter if you checkmate your opponent. I mean, who cares, right? All right. So he played knight e4, and he's going to start playing for checkmate. Bishop d6. Gets his other knight out. Rook f6. Rook h6. This is like when I'm playing one minute chess, this is how I play. Rook f6, rook h6, sacrifice unsoundly, and then their flag falls or I mate them. Okay, but this is real life. This is against another grandmaster. G3 blocking the bishop. It's funny, if it was black's move here, this looks pretty dangerous. Bishop takes, knight takes, queen h4. That looks pretty scary to me. Maybe I'm easily scared. Okay, well, he stopped that. Queen out. Yeah, this is how I always play bishop f1. G5. Not very subtle. He just plays for mate. See, G4. Okay, and now he played a famous move. This is one of the moves that made the game famous. That would make the game famous if he won. Let's call on a random student, Archer. And this is the overworked theme. Okay, This is like when Karen was playing that giant in Charlotte. And then you sacked your rook. Yeah. Okay. This king is defending the H and the F pawn. You agree. So he takes the H pawn, then he takes the F pawn. White's king is really safe, except it isn't. <laughs> right. Okay. So he retreated. Always retreat. Knight f6. He wants to play knight h5, knight g3 mate with advantage. And this knight can't move because then queen takes queen. And the queen and bishop can't. None of these pieces can do anything. Okay. So we got to get that queen out of there. Rook e2. Knight b1. That way his queen can come over and defend, I guess. Knight h5. 
Bishop d7, getting the rook into the game. Check. Bishop g3. That's a lot of attacking pieces. Scared. g3. Rook f8. Finally, he got his rook into there. Bishop e1. So white got a pretty good defense. That's, that's pretty good. I, I agree with that defense. Bishop f1. Okay, this knight's not very good. All right, so why did Black put his rook on f8? To not sacrifice it? To sacrifice it. Yeah. Rawr! That stopped white from playing bishop f1. Good job. Now we can vote. We haven't voted yet. Pretty late in the class to have not voted. You can vote for king takes being the best move or queen takes. Who votes for king takes? Who votes for queen takes? It was about, it was like four to three. I don't think Archer's move is the best because it hangs mate in one. Yeah. So probably not the best, right? Queen takes, queen h2 mate. So he took with the king. There you go. All right, now the king and queen are lined up. Hmm. Oliver. E five. That's what I would play in a one minute game. E5. Threatening Bishop H3, recommended by Shirov, and Ginger GM. Man, does anybody get either one of those jokes? I know who's what? Ginger GM is. Yeah, Ginger yeah. GM likes to put it in H. There's a lot of stuff on the H file. And Shirov likes to play Bishop H3. No, nothing. All right. All right, so King G1, Bishop G4. Now, if it was Black's move, that looks pretty good, right? Also, that looks pretty good. Luckily, if White resigns soon, he's set up for the next game. So that's good. Bishop takes g3. Knight takes. Now, Black's down the exchange, but he's threatening everything. Saves his rook. Knife f5. Call that a knife? Notice how it's a retreat, but it threatens the rook on e1. You see what I'm saying? It's called a discovered attack. Because after I told you, you discovered that I was right. Well, the problem is, if the rook goes sideways, I can take this. And if you don't move the rook, I can do that. So you got to do something. So queen f2. Queen g5. Threatening double, triple, quadruple discovered check. Every bishop move is check. Confusing the audience. <laughs> Takes on e5, terrible defense. And then he resigned, because, you know, it's getting scary over here. Yeah. So, great game by uh, Tartakower, and Spencer said his most famous game. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. But, yeah, he set up for the next game, so that's good. So, again, Tartakower's saying was sacrifice your opponent's pieces, but we haven't seen that yet. We've seen him sacrifice his own pieces and made his opponents king. And I try to show you games against famous people, and this one kid's like, you mean the Marazzi bind? So he must be famous. Man, that wasn't a good bind, was it? That was, it didn't work too well. Frankly, terrible. Okay, now, before I show you the game with Alakine, which I want to finish with, I want to show you this other thing. Okay, it's a thing. All right. And then, let's see, Spencer said, I do this. And then he said, I do this. And then he said, I do this. Okay, this is the game Tartakower Rubenstein. Has anybody heard of Rubenstein? Okay, is he your favorite pianist? No. No? Okay. Has anybody heard of the pianist Rubenstein? Yeah. You have? Yeah. What about your mom? <laughs> yeah, obviously. And Holden. What, what about the gawking rabble over here? I can prove they're gawking rabble. I have a shirt. Yeah. There's a shirt. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. I'm not even making that up. Yeah, move the chair away from the wall. Okay. Now here, I told you guys Tartakower liked my stream, and you guys were laughing. But look at this. He doubled up on the bubble up. Okay? So pretty good. Now here, Tartakower's playing Rubenstein. Rubenstein's pretty good. Some people think... Rubenstein's the greatest player never to be world champion. 
Also, if I remember correctly, and I don't, I think I did a class on Rubinstein, Great Players of the Past. And Karen's like, no, I think I did. I think you did. Yeah. Okay, now here Tarnakar played Queen G, played Rook G3, I was close, with obvious threat. What's the obvious threat? You! Um, knight takes F6. Correct. After knight F6, white is marginally butter, right? That you can ask Joaquin Phoenix. A complicated joke. All right, now here, according to the engines and the gawking rabble online, black made the losing move. But it did stop knight f6. Okay, he should have played, I think, rook f8, they said. That seems like a pretty defensive move. He played the obvious move, put it in h. King h8. And now Tarek Hauer played a very long, complicated tactical sequence confusing the audience. There was like forks and tactics and captures and spinning in a circle, you. Rook takes, G7. Rook takes G7. You gotta take that, otherwise you lost your G7 pawn. And then, knight takes, knight takes F6. It's a fork and a spoon. Gotta move your queen, the queen's attacked. You gotta take back, okay? And now, Tarek Hauer not only knew my rules, because he watched my stream, he knew when to break my rules. Queen f4, and then never play f6. f6. After queen f4, you, you got to play rook e7. Well, you got no, you got no choice. Okay. f6. Well, he can't allow pawn takes rook, so he played. Knight g6. Played where? Knight g6. Knight g6. Man, then rook takes rook looks pretty good. Rook e6. Right? Then knight takes he did play knight g6. You're right. Yeah. What do you want to play? Man, then f7, truth hurts. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Although I guess f7, you play knight f7. Yeah, so after rook e6, I would sack a Juia, then f7. What? I was, I was thinking about rookie one. Rookie one, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, now if queen f8 here, and then if here, checkmate. Also checkmate. Yeah. Confusing the audience. All right. Yeah, that's so he played knight g6 because Oliver said so, and Oliver just got first place. Rook takes. What's the only good move? Knight takes, and now the sneakiest move ever. You, f7. f7. The truth hurts. Threatening pawn takes queen and queen f6 mate and queen e5 mate. Now, I'm going to tell you a Feingold saying that I rarely, rare, very rare. I have a lot of Feingold rules. This is a Feingold rule. I don't say very often. I've said it a few times. There's a well-known saying in chess, a pawn on the seventh is worth a rook. See, so a couple of guys have heard it. Yeah, I, I have my own saying. It's a variation of that. A pawn on the seventh is worth more than a rook. If I have a pawn on the seventh, my pawn has a rook. He can have his rook. Pawn on the seventh is pretty good. Yeah, and so obviously he resigns. Yeah, and he resigned here. Now, that was nice. King h8 loses by force to just taking stuff. Now, one of the disparaging comments players make today about players a long time ago is they didn't defend very well. So if you see Morphy versus Doofus, Doofus isn't playing too good. If you see Carlson versus Karyakin and Carlson wins, Probably Karyakin played pretty well. He probably didn't hang mate and one on move 12, right? He probably didn't miss, like, queen a4 check winning a piece, right? Although, if you watch some of Fabi's blitz games. Anyway, so these kinds of things, even though they're several moves long, players today would claim 
Yeah, grandmasters don't miss that now. I mean, obviously they do. I can show you examples from today. <clears throat> um, anyway, for example, in this position, if you were one of the best players in the world now, top 10, top 20 in the world, a lot of grandmasters would claim, well, Karyakin wouldn't play King H8 because he would see this, this, this. He'd be like, nah, that's losing. And then he would play like, you know, whatever the better move is, Rook F8 or something. Probably that's true. Rubenstein's a great player, but still allowed it. Now, just to hit back a little bit, there was a game today played in the Cairns Cup. I won't say that Irina Crush was playing. Oh, wait, I already did. Okay, that's why she's not in this room. And she played bishop to d1. Her opponent played rook d8. Was skewering her queen and bishop. So, uh, yeah. All right. I mean, in time trouble, lots of stuff happens. Okay, this looks like getting close to time trouble. They look like they've played about 30 moves. So time, when it's time trouble, people... This isn't really a blunder in time trouble. That's a long series of captures and pawn pushes. Yeah. Now, if he has an hour on his clock, and see, if you lose to somebody because they beat you in 70 moves with subtle play, that's okay if you're a grandmaster. But if somebody does this and then you have to resign because you didn't see the tactics, grandmasters usually don't fall for that. Otherwise, they wouldn't be grandmasters. So when you beat somebody like that and you see more than they did, that's pretty cool. All right, now we get to the pièce de résistance, right? Finally, he beats a world champion. Okay, this is Alekhine Tartakower, 1933. Now, I could be wrong because Alekhine was world champion, then he lost to Max Erva, then he beat him again. So I don't know if Irva was the world champion here or Alekhine was. 1933, I don't know. I'm going to say Alekhine was, even though I could be wrong. Man, the comments on YouTube are going to... Come on, don't you realize that in this time period, Irva was... But anyway, Alekhine was probably the best player in the world in 1933. Now, he was not the best player in the world in 1927 when he beat... Which world champion did he beat in a world championship match? To become world champion. Yeah, what a class. What year? 1927. How did Alekhine become world champion? Who did he beat? Lasker. Close. Can't be closer. The guy who beat Lasker. Now, now you're going the wrong way. In the middle. What? Capablanca. 27, Capablanca was better than Alekhine. However, in 33, Capablanca wasn't young anymore. So, I don't know, maybe, maybe Alekhine was better. Maybe. Maybe. Anyway, Alekhine's white against Tartakower. Half of you never heard of Tartakower before today, although half of them haven't heard of Alekhine. And he's playing the world champion in the chess Olympia. That's a pretty important event, right? Okay. And he plays the Tartakower variation. Bam! As we saw before, B6. Right? That's the charter cover. Now you might say, I don't understand. Why is he playing b6? Well, this bishop doesn't have a lot of good squares over here, does it? See how that pawn's blocking it? So he wants to feed and counter his bishop. Ah, that's better. And they play the charter cover today. Grandmaster still play it. Good opening. Okay, it was played today in the game Humpy Canero, which I think you mentioned. And I think she's won her game. I mean, she was really winning when we started the lecture. So, and she, this is the position they had. Bishop b7. Okay, now, white did something. Rook d1. Al Alakine playing queen c2, rook d1, is saying, look, I don't, I don't want you to take that and open up the bishop because my rook's to be open on your queen, trying to stop that diagonal from getting open. Okay, and then he took that and close the diagonal so the bishop can't, we can't get in there, blocking the bishop. Knight h5, trading pieces, and he says no. c4 I don't like. It's explosive. Not really a big fan of queen a4 either. Okay, confusing the audience. Very strange position. This knight's trapped, but it's going to take the bishop. That'll make it less trapped. And now here comes the pawn. I didn't like queen a4. 
that just encouraged Black to push the pawns. And finally, he takes the bishop. And according to my stream, what does Black have? What else? Two bishops. Two bishops. What else? Two bishops, more space on the queen's side. Alakine, is he known as the most boring player ever or a great attacking player? Attacking. He's got the bishop and the queen lined up, and he's got his knights here. It looks like Alakine's going to sacrifice and mate him. That's why Tartar of Power played queen e8. Defense. Don't let the guy checkmate you. So if Alakine doesn't checkmate him, Black's got pretty strong pawns over here. Bishop d6. Here comes Alakine trying to checkmate him. And they just trade pieces. And White's position falls apart because he has no mate. Now Black's going to play checkmate. Too bad. Exactly. Okay, Alyakin doesn't want to get checkmated. So what did he do in this position? You! Close enough. Queen g3. Queen h3 trading queens. That'd be a really bad pawn structure. Yeah. Okay, now they get to an ending... Obviously, black's better because doubled pawns, isolated pawn, beautiful knight, beautiful bishop, and after f5, tic-tac-toe. Yeah. Okay, so black has a great position here. C3 is weak. Maybe my knight will come in there. Okay, and Alakine, who tried to get a checkmating attack with his queen and bishop and knights, they just traded all the pieces. Now his bishop on b1 is silly. If you checkmate your opponent, that's pretty good. If you don't checkmate him, you're like, why is that bishop on b1? <laughs> Terrible. And by the way, this happens to grandmasters all the time. If I go into the tournament room across the hall, when you guys are playing in a tournament, I'll be like, oh, that piece is terrible. Why'd you put that piece there? And the answer is because you're terrible. You're like, oh, there's a good square. And then you're like, hmm, that's no good. Oh, well. When grandmasters do it, they're like, I'm going to mate him. Then they mate you. However, if they don't mate you, then you're like, why'd you do that? Well, I thought I was going to mate him. Right? So Alakine's like, I'm the world champion. I thought I was going to checkmate him by sacrificing on G6 and F7. And Charterkower said, this lecture's about me, not about you, Alakine. <laughs> All right, d5, let's get that pass pawn going. Let's take it. Let's get it going. Rook c5, going to put something on d5. That's not good for that passed pawn. Man. Double up on the bubble up. There's a fork. Got a trade. Now the knight's coming to c3. The rook's taking on d6. This bishop is still terrible. Defends his pawn. Saves his bishop. Little fork. Can't take on b4 because your bishop's hanging. Alakine trades pawns. That's how you draw the endgame. Then he sacrifices a piece. Now this is what we call desperation. I would call it giving up. Okay. Once you're down a piece, you're going to lose for sure. But he didn't know what to do because he's so lost. He's like, man, that's the worst bishop ever. Let me take all of the pawns. Now, he is right. If he does take all of the pawns, and it's rook and knight versus rook, then it's a draw. So, so Alakine's like, I'm going to take this pawn. I'm going to take this pawn. Maybe I can draw. And then he says, now you're not going to take my pawns. No way. And he's just up at night. And eventually he sacrifices the knight so he can get a winning rook end game. Should we take the rook? No. No. So he plays here. And rook and two versus rook. Now, I must say, in the 1930s, 1920s, etc., when these guys were good, end game technique wasn't um, what they were known for. Maybe Capablanca. Otherwise, pretty suspicious. Okay? Because there weren't dozens of books on the end games. There weren't articles about it. 
They didn't have a lot of practice. But when I played this game over earlier today, I thought Black played perfect every move. So what do I know? And there's a famous Rook and Two versus Rook that's in a lot of Endgame books because um, it was one of the first examples that was known. Obviously, they had it before, but they weren't writing the games down necessarily two, three hundred years ago. And it was in a World Championship match that Steinitz had, I think, against Zuckertor. Steinitz's technique was a little iffy. Okay, this is obviously later. But, man, Black, Black's play was really good. I mean, every move Black played, I wish I would have played. So you're like, well, how do you win? The Black King isn't playing. The Black King can't move up. Because the pawns are on the side. If the black pawns are in the middle, we could go to you know one side or the other. But I can't go here. won't let me. How does black move his king up? What did he do? He did move his king up. How did he do it? You. Rook c3, then rook c5. Rook c3, then rook c5. Then we move our king up. Good job. Well, now what does he do? He can't check. He can't move his king up. His pawns can't really move up. See, that's why I thought it was good technique. I thought he, he played great. Moved his king back because you can't check the king. What's black's next move going to be? A4. A4. I get his pawns going. Okay, now if you play A4, I can try to check you forever. So now I don't like A4. But he played a much better move. King C4. Even better. King C4 wins, A4 wins. This is a good Zwischenzug. I like this move a lot. Um, rook, rook check. Now if you move the king up, checkmate is annoying. Although you don't really want to move the king back, do you? Uh, you have to. Okay. Then they move the king up. I like that. He went back to b5, then the circumstances change, now he goes back. Now we're going to move our king up, so he tries to stop him, but he can't stop him. Yeah, and now he resigned because it's, it's over now. Yeah, Black played perfect that game, moved his king up. Now, a lot of times, let's take somebody like me. I'm a grandmaster, and you're like, yeah, you're a grandmaster, and you roll your eyes, right? Okay, you're like, what about Carlson and Anon and Kramnik, Karpov? Those are grandmasters. You're some guy sitting in a chair, right? And if I beat those guys, right, and you're like, hmm, how did Ben beat Carlson? How would he do that? What's the most likely way? Because they fall asleep and you win. Well, that is one of the likeliest. The most likely way I would beat somebody in the top ten is they would make a one-move blunder. They play better than me, but oops, and they hang a rook or mate or a knight, and then they can't recover because I'm too winning. It's not likely... I play 70 good moves, and Carlson plays worse than me, so I win. That's not likely. Oh yeah, Ben's just better than Carlson, so he just played good, and Carlson not quite as good. But if I did beat those guys, it could be Carlson had the advantage that he blundered. And that one blunder ruins the other 70 moves of the game. Okay, That's why I like this game. Alakine didn't blunder. Tartakauer played better than Alakine. Tartakauer was black. And they played a very interesting game, and Black came out on top because Black played better. Okay, that's because they were at the same level. Alakine, obviously a more famous player, world champion, considered stronger. But Tartakauer didn't win because Alakine hung his queen. For example, you've heard of David Bronstein. Well, a couple of you have, right? Yeah. I beat him once because he hung his queen. And then he ain't going to win when he hangs his queen. I don't care who he is. Okay, and he resigned when he hung his queen. Okay. But it wasn't that Alakai made a one-move blunder. Tartakai was just really good. And on the internet, they were arguing, because that's what they do, about whether Tartakai could have been the world champion. Was he good enough? And one guy said it, he said it right. Said, well, Lasker, Capablanca, and Alakai. If none of them were ever born, then maybe. But with those guys born, he ain't going to be the world champion. But yeah, in a universe without those three guys, maybe Tartakar would have been world champion at some point. This is my point when I try to prove how good Karpov was. People are like, who's Karpov? I never heard of him. Okay, Karpov is one of the top five players of all time. And 
If you can imagine a universe where Kasparov was never born, Karpov would have been world champion for 20 years. That's a long time. But he was only world champion for 10 years because Kasparov was born. But when Kasparov was the world champion, nobody was better than Karpov except maybe Kasparov. And even then, I don't know. But nobody else was even close. I mean, it wasn't like, oh, Kasparov's the world champion. I wonder who number two is. No, nobody wondered that. Okay? The difference between Karpov and number three was huge. Those guys were the best. They played like five world championship matches together. Okay? So Tartakower, unfortunately, was living in the time when Lastro was world champion for like 27 years, and Capablanca was the chess genius, and Alakine stopped drinking for 10 minutes, so he beat Capablanca. So, you know. Then, then he started drinking again, so Herba beat him. So that's, that's when you know. So what's the lesson from this? Don't drink. And as long as you weren't here two weeks ago for the Tall Lecture, you'll believe me. And as Mikhail Tall would say, class dismissed. <laughs>